Amen. Well, it is so good to see you today. Uh, We are continuing in our sermon series from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 18. And for the remainder of 2022, which it's not long, we're in November, but for the remainder of 2022, we'll be teaching and preaching from the Gospel of Luke. Now, if you did not bring a Bible with you today, you're welcome to use one of the Bibles under the seats in front of you. You can reach down there, grab the Bible, and if you turn to page 1,843, you'll find the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 18, right there. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, we want you to take one of our Bibles home with you. Scratch out the name of Calvary that's stamped on the inside cover. Write your name down. We want you to have a copy of the Word of God and read the Word of God. But here's the caveat. We don't want you just to read it or own it. We don't want you to take that Bible and set it out on the nightstand when a pastor comes by to visit with you. We want you to take that Bible and begin to read it. And as you read it, we want you to apply God's Word to your life. If you want to experience hope in your relationships, if you want to hear experience hope in your marriage, in your family, in life, as you begin to apply God's word, you're going to experience transformation. God is going to change and transform your life. Now, I want to take a moment and welcome our Parker campus with us today. Uh, Pastor Ruben is, has been away with the Jerusalem trip that left here from Calvary. He's on his way back. I know that he and Joanna are, are going to have lots of stories to share with you, uh, but now you're stuck with me. So if you don't have a Bible, you can jump up and grab a Bible in the back of the room. They're located on the table and, uh, and we'll be walking through Luke chapter 18 with you as well. Today in our passage of scripture, we're going to be looking at a story of a man that Jesus invited, hey, come follow me, but the man rejected following Jesus. And the reason why he rejected, uh, I'm already giving you the, the punchline, the reason why he rejected that invitation to follow Jesus is because he could not let go of his stuff. He could not let go of the stuff that he'd accumulated. He could not let go of his past. He could not let go of his wealth. And the reality is letting go of what we find important, it can be a really difficult thing. When I was in college, I spent my summers at a Christian camp in the mountains of Colorado, and it was the perfect spot for a zip line. One of the activities that we offered to the kids during the week was a zip line and the mountains and the valleys and the lakes were perfect and provided a perfect environment for a zip line. So this camp had a zip line. I think it, it sat about 200, 300 feet in the air on one end and it stretched out a quarter of a mile long over a lake and came to the bank of where kind of camp was. It was crazy fast, it was crazy high, and it always made middle school boys scream like little girls. The rider would step into a harness. They would kind of pull him up like shorts and there was a strap that connected to the harness. And at the top of the strap was a pulley and the pulley would go over a big cable. And when the rider was ready, all they had to do is sit down and let the harness do the rest of the work. Let the pulley do the rest of the work. Sit down in the harness, lift their feet up and they would fly across the lake. So the very first time I tried that, my body kicked into like fight or flight mode, right? I'm looking, I'm standing over pine trees. The tops of pine trees are way down below me. And I'm thinking, this is it. This is idiot. This is stupid. Don't do it. The cable's going to break. The pulley's going to go bad. The strap's going to break. They didn't buckle you in correctly. All those thoughts are going through my mind. And I forced myself to overcome the panic that I felt. And with the harness on, I stepped off the rocks and started flying to the other side. And I was almost halfway across when I realized that I wasn't trusting the harness. 
I was clinging to that strap as tight as I could. I never sat down in the harness and I'm holding myself up. I'm like, And when I realized that I wasn't trusting the harness, I started letting go with my arms and putting my weight on the harness. And I felt that I was being held up. And then I finally let go of the strap with my hands. It was the most exhilarating experience of my entire life. Like it was incredible because I was riding in this zip line. I wasn't trusting the harness. And when I finally let go, I was able to enjoy the ride. Now I was a chicken to let go. There's no doubt about it, but it really was one of the most incredible first moments of my life. So help me out by raising your hand. Okay, you knew it was coming. If you have ever ridden on a zip line, would you raise your hand? All right, thank you. Uh, if you hesitated when you took that first step off the cliff or whatever it was, raise your hand. All right, thanks. And if you know somebody that you would like to push off a zip line cliff, raise your hand. <laughs> Boy, we all do, right? <laughs> Letting go. It really is one of the most difficult things to do. And today I want to invite you to let go. Let go of whatever it is that's holding you back. Let go of whatever it is that's hindering your relationship with others. Let go of whatever it is that's hindering your relationship with God. Let's read together Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 18 on page 1,843. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, well, one thing you still lack, sell all you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we've left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Now in this passage of scripture, we're gonna cover a couple things, but in this passage of scripture, this was a man that appeared to have it all together on the surface. It seemed like he had everything going for him in life. Now, most likely as he was a ruler and he was wealthy, he was probably respected in the community. He had wealth. He seemed to live with integrity. He respected his parents. But under the surface, beneath the perception that others had of him, this man knew his own heart. He knew something wasn't quite right. Though he had lots of wealth, though he had the respect of the community, he knew something wasn't right. Something was bothering him. Something was troubling him. And what was troubling him was the fact that he did not know if he had eternal life. He, he sought out Jesus and he said, look, I, I'm successful in my life. This is my paraphrase. I'm successful, how can I be successful in eternity? How can I be successful in the life that comes after I die? 
Now, this man asked the right question to the right person. He asked, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Now, it shows us that this man wasn't just thinking about his life here on this earth, but he was thinking about what he could not see. He understood that there was a spiritual life that would go on after he died, and he wanted to know if he was going to get into heaven. And I think many friends and family members, maybe even many of you here today, I think we, many people still have that very basic question, what is it going ta to take for me to get into heaven? Like the man asked Jesus, I want to and I ask you a rhetorical question. Have you inherited eternal life? Ha have you personally inherited eternal life? Now, I understand many of us have questions about what that's going to look like. Many of us have, many of us have questions about what heaven is really going to be like. <coughs> and the truth is, we don't have all the answers. We don't know exactly what heaven is going to be like. But God does give us a little taste and a little look at what heaven is going to be like in Revelation 21, one through four. The apostle John described eternal life as he was describing heaven. And he said this, that God's home in 21, Revelation 21, verse three, God's home is now among his people that God will live with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Now that's typically a passage of scripture that I would use for a celebration of life because as we think about what it is next for followers of Jesus, we like to be comforted by what we understand heaven is going to be like. In heaven, followers of Jesus are going to be in the presence of God for all eternity. And wherever God is, there is no pain. Wherever God is, there is no need, there's no sorrow, there's no hungry stomachs. In heaven, there's going to be no more cancer. Can I get an amen? No more heart failure, no more disease, no more broken hearts, no death, no sorrow, no sickness, no pain, no frustration, no depression, no anxiety, that God will wipe every tear from our eyes. And if you've experienced hurt, if you've experienced confusion, if you've experienced sadness and sorrow, like we all have, because we live in a world that is broken because of sin, you understand that this thought of no more sorrow, no more pain, like that's huge. Like that is a big, big deal. Living with God for all eternity is absolutely amazing. But this man, he had questions about eternal life, but he was more concerned about what his temporary life was going to be like. He was more concerned about his, what his life was going to be like without his stuff. He was narrow-minded. He couldn't really grasp the big picture. He didn't realize that his 50, 60, 70 years of life that he was going to live was nothing compared to the infinite presence of God in his life. He, he focused so much on the short term and the temporary, he couldn't wrap his mind about what an eternity would look like in the presence of God. So he walked away rejecting hope. He walked away rejecting eternal life. What about you? In John 5, 24, Jesus clearly communicates what it, uh, how a person could know that they have eternal life. 
Jesus said in John 5, 24, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. They won't come into judgment, but they, they passed from death into life. Jesus said that the only way to receive that eternal life that this young man had questions about is by hearing and believing. So first hearing what? The words of Jesus, God's word. You cannot have eternal life unless you hear God's word that is the good news about Jesus. And you're already doing that right now. You're already halfway there. If, if when you look at that first life note and you say, I don't know that I have eternal life. Well, right now you're halfway there because you're hearing the words of Jesus. But halfway is not close enough. The word Jesus used for belief in that passage, John 5, 24, is pastuyo. It means to trust in, to entrust, to commit. Jesus says belief is more than head knowledge. And, and I really want you to understand that. You can know everything there is about creation and about the fall of man and about man rejecting God and about Jesus dying on the cross for man's sin and Jesus uh, rising from the dead and that one day he's going to return. You can know all of that and still reject eternal life. The Bible tells us in the book of James that even the demons believe even the demons believe what Jesus did on the cross. It's not enough to inherit eternal life. That word belief is more than a head knowledge. See, if you truly entrust your life to Jesus, you let go of anything that you once valued as more important than Jesus. Uh, I believe that zip line strap was going to hold me up, but until I stopped gripping the strap with my hands, I did not entrust my life to the strap and to the harness. Uh, I wanted to hang on and hold myself up, but I, be I believed it could hold me. I'd seen everybody else go before me, but until I took an action and lowered myself down and let go of the strap, it didn't matter what I believed. I did not entrust my life to the strap until I let go. Jesus used that word pastuyo in John 3, 16, when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes, whoever entrusts their lives to him, whoever commits their life to him, whoever believes and takes an action, will not perish, but have everlasting life. Everybody who lets go, who trusts in and commits. Believing in Jesus means accepting what Jesus did for you on the cross. Believing in Jesus means receiving. It requires an action, not just a head knowledge. And it requires a moment of surrender. And that surrender looks something like Romans 10, 9 where the apostle Paul wrote, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus, if when you hit that first question and you looked at it and you said, I don't know that I have eternal life. You can leave today letting go and trusting in Jesus as your savior. And if you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus, if you're ready to receive eternal life and receive forgiveness for your sins, then I invite you quietly just to surrender your life to Jesus right now. I invite you to quietly close your eyes, bow your heads, and just simply say, God, I wanna live forever with you in heaven. Up until this moment, I've lived selfishly, I've sinned, I've not followed you, but I'm ready to become a follower of Jesus right now and I surrender my life to you. 
I believe Jesus paid the price for my sins. I believe he suffered, died, and was buried and rose from the dead. And I receive Jesus as my savior and commit and entrust my life to you. Thank you, God, for giving me eternal life. Now, if you just gave your life to Jesus, if you just surrendered your life to Jesus, if you just said something like that, you didn't have to say those exact words, but you believed and you put your faith in, our prayer team is gonna be here at the close of the, the, the worship, at the close of the last song. They would love to talk to you. Grab one of those connect cards, fill it out and just say, hey, I just entrusted my life to Jesus and somebody's gonna follow up with you and pray with you. Now, Let's suppose every one of us now in this room, we're all followers of Jesus. The people that showed up before, they just surrendered their life to Jesus. We're all followers of Jesus. And as a follower of Jesus, as we seek to follow him, we all have to remember, don't let your butt get in the way. You can take that however you wanna take it. Don't let your butt get in the way as you follow Jesus. Now, Jesus wasn't communicating to this man that he had to give away all of his stuff. It was a test of the man's heart, right? That's why Jesus referred to the 10 commandments. Uh, the guy was basically looking at Jesus. Jesus was asking, hey, have you uh, obeyed your parents? Oh, yes, Lord. Raise your hand if you know that's a lie. <laughs> Is there any person in this room who has always obeyed their parents? Raise your hand. Because we want to see an example of a perfect person. Jesus said, hey, have you ever committed adultery? He's like, oh no, Lord, I never, never committed adultery, never had a lustful thought. Have you ever lied? Oh no, Lord, right? Have you ever cheated? No, Lord. Essentially, this man was standing there lying to Jesus. That's what was happening in this passage. He's like, oh man, I want to inherit eternal life. Jesus said, okay, uh, have you ever lied, stolen, cheated? No, I've never done those things. I have been perfect. No matter what Jesus would have told this man to do, the man would have said he'd already done it. But Jesus knew the one thing he could say to this man that the man was going to realize he wasn't perfect. And he said, okay, you've done all those things since your youth, great. Now take your possessions and all your stuff and give it away. Give it away to the poor, sell it, get rid of it. And then after you've abandoned everything, you can come and follow me. See, if the man really had loved the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, if he really loved his neighbor as himself, since he was a child, giving away his possessions, it wouldn't have been anything. It wouldn't have been a big deal. If he was really perfect, he would have done it immediately. But in his mind, his process was, well, I want eternal life, but I really like my stuff. I want eternal life. I want to follow Jesus, but I really like who I am in this life. And as a follower of Jesus, I think how often I've been like that man. Or as a follower of Jesus, how often have you been like that man? Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you lead, but I'm not gonna cross the street to my, to my neighbor who's loud at night because I'm really bothered by them. Or, or Jesus, I love my neighbor as myself, but I really don't have time for them today. Or Jesus, uh, I, I'm going to begin to give generously, but I got to set my vacation money aside first, Lord. You know how that is. Or, or, or God, I'm going to seek reconciliation with my family, but I really would like for them to make the first move. God, I I'm going to start speaking softly and gently to my spouse or my children, but they really get on my nerves. See, as followers of Jesus, we tend to let our butts get in the way, right? We, we, we tend to make excuses to not follow Jesus. God, I really want to do this, but I don't really want to. 
if we always make excuses as followers of Jesus, you're not going to lose your eternal life, but you are going to miss out on incredible blessings that God has for you. See, if we always make excuses about serving at Main Street or, or getting plugged into a life group and leading, opening up our home for a life group or following Jesus in obedience and serving in our student ministry or children's ministry or serving in your community or loving your neighbor as yourself or showing grace and mercy to other people, if we always make excuses, we're going to miss out on the blessings that God has for us. It's important that followers of Jesus remember it is a lifestyle of surrender that reaps an eternity of blessing. It's a lifestyle of surrender that reaps an eternity of blessing. In verse 22, Jesus invited the man to let go and follow him. And what I love about that word follow is it's not it's not used in the same way we would follow a dictator or somebody that was forcing us to follow them. It's not going ahead of people and leading them. What Jesus means when he communicates, when he uses that word follow, he uses the Greek word akalutheo, which means to accompany, to attend, or literally it means to travel along the same way. Jesus invited the man, not just to, to give up everything, but he invited him to travel with him, to accompany him. And he wasn't just simply saying, I want you to walk with me. Jesus was also saying to this rich young ruler, I want to walk with you. You are valuable to me. And I don't want to just lead you down a road. I want to walk with you. I want to do life with you. I want to enjoy a relationship with you. I want to accompany you. And that's the way Jesus is with you and I. When we think about Jesus leading us, understand he wants to enjoy that relationship with you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to accompany you through life, through all of the hurts, through all of the pain, through all of the joys, through all of the fun. Jesus wants to accompany you because he cares for you. He loves you. Yes, he guides and directs our steps. He guides us along the path. But here's what I love about that invitation. Jesus is not embarrassed to be seen by your side, right? He's not embarrassed of us. He's not embarrassed of you. He loves you and wants you to accompany him. He wants you to follow him and enjoy a relationship as you walk. He knows that sometimes you drag your feet. He knows that sometimes you go places that you shouldn't go. He knows that sometimes you do things, say things, act a certain way that you shouldn't do. He knows that and guess what? He's not embarrassed of you one bit. He loves being with you. You have value. You belong to him. You've been cleansed from your sin and he just wants you to enjoy the ride. He wants you to follow him and walk in obedience. Jesus communicated to this man, look, you're going to become overwhelmed with other things in your life, but I want to accompany you as well. I want to join you. I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. I will walk beside you even if you choose to abandon me. I will never not be there for you. That's what Jesus means when he says, come, follow me. And as followers of Jesus, we are assured of his forgiveness for our past, for our sin. We are assured of his promise to walk with us through life and the promise of eternal life in the future. There really is no good excuse for not following Jesus, is there? There's really not one good excuse. So let's keep following Jesus. Let's keep enjoying the presence of Jesus in our lives and continue to enjoy the presence of others as we walk along the road. 
Let's pray together. God, thank you for this passage of scripture. Thank you for what it means to trust. Thank you for what it means to commit our lives to. And Lord, we want to invite you today to continue to move in our hearts, changing us, transforming us. And Lord, we lift up that individual or two individuals or three individuals, whoever it was that gave their lives to Jesus today. We pray your blessing over them. We ask that you encourage them and strengthen them. And Lord, help us not to make excuses as we seek to follow you. You have all the answers. You love to be with us and you love us. So God, thank you for that. We invite you to continue to work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.